and then he gives it away, and then the miracle. There was enough. Not only was there enough, there was more than enough. And everyone ate their fill. They weren't just filled, they had full lives. But then when evening comes, when did it start? The disciples leave and they cross the Sea of Galilee. The storm comes up. Jesus is not with them. He walks across the water, gets in the boat, and they're on the other side. Back at the ranch. The crowd wakes up in the morning after this wonderful picnic. And Jesus and the disciples are gone. And when they realize that they have left during the night, the crowd gets in the boats and they begin to go across the sea and they start searching for Jesus. It is like this huge game of hide and seek around the Sea of Galilee. And those of us who want to follow Jesus, the church, those of us who gather here, doesn't it seem sometimes as if Jesus is right here? You know it. And you know it because you feel it. Your love, your life is so good. You know the love and the intimacy and the beauty that fills your life. And you know Jesus has to be there. Just as he was the day before filling the multitude. And your life is full. But then there's the next day after the darkness. And it all falls apart. And you begin to wonder where is he? Where did he go in the dark of the night? In the darkness of our lives. And so the crowd, those wanting to follow Jesus, the church goes on this hide and seek. We seek him out. And as they find him, the crowd literally becomes the second person in this dialogue. And the dialogue revolves around three questions. The first question is a bit tricky to translate. Literally it means, where are you here or when are you here? The Gospel of John always talks on two levels. That's not a surprise. It's always talking on two levels. On the one level, there's the physical level. How did you get to the other side? We didn't see you get in the boats. We didn't, and all of a sudden you escaped. But it's more than that. The second level is if you can do what you did yesterday, if you can fill the multitude, feed the multitude with five loaves and two fish, then where are you really from? And if you're really from there and able to do this, where are you now today? My sister is visiting. They had a wonderful special. Your golf course is great. <laughs> the Marriott. And they were running a great special. And, you know, we had to go out. And so my sister and I, we went out and we decided we would play golf. And really, it was 17 holes and I was on. <laughs> it was going to be one of those days you will remember. For those of you who have not played it, the 18th hole is terrible. <laughs> you have to crush a drive. And then there's this floating green. I crushed my drive. I was only about 130 yards from the green. All I had to do was put it on. I was going to walk away with one of the best players of my life. I hit the ball, it goes straight into the I put down the next ball, it goes straight into the water. I put eight balls in a row <laughs> into the water. Finally, I said that with no, and I just. I look at Karen and I said, where in the world did that come from? <laughs> because it wasn't the norm. And if it was the norm and I could do that, why didn't I do it on the first swing? <laughs> this is sort of the question the people ask Jesus. If you can really do this, and we know you can't because you did it yesterday, why don't you do it today? Now, because we're hungry all over again. And yet Jesus looks at the crowd and he begins to say, you're looking for the bread that perishes. You're not looking for this bread that sustains, that won't run out. This which you can build a lifetime on. It is almost as if Jesus looks at us, looks at the crowds, and he looks at the church and says, you don't see me because you're not looking right. And that brings the second question. We want to look right. We want to be a part of this. We want to have this eternal food. What must we do to do the works of God so we can see and be a part of this eternal life? Preachers love it when people ask this question. Because we interpret the work of God into the work of the church. We need a little more money. 
We need Sunday school teachers. We need some more people to cut the grass. And we have this wonderful list. And we get, well, you just do this, this. Jesus doesn't give the preacher answer. Instead, he gives the answer of faith. The answer of faith is trust. Trust the one that God has sent. Trust that whether you're eating bread this morning or not, the living bread of God is still here. Here's the challenge of the faith. I had to trust Jesus was present in those first eight balls that went into the water. <laughs> Just as much as he was present in the ninth one that landed right next to the cup. And I'll tell you what, I didn't see Jesus in those first eight. <laughs> I don't know where he went, but it was dark on that golf course that moment. If the power is if you want to sustain your life, not just the temporary joys that come and go, but something that will be there for eternity, then you must tell us that somehow he is there in full. And it brings the third question. Third question is, what sign will you show us? How can we be sure? We need to know for sure before we can trust you completely. Moses fed the people in the wilderness with the manna. What are you going to do? What are you doing? And when I can't see you, I can believe you're still there. I don't know, how many of you in fifth grade Sunday school, did you have those Old Testament books? I don't know, fifth grade for me was Old Testament. And they had hard covers on them. And, those, and it was a terrible curriculum. <laughs> and I remember this story completely because we opened up and we were reading the story of the man coming down. They were fully baked loaves, like wholesome bread dropping down out of heaven. And of course, Sunday school teachers trying to make sense out of this for us. And of course, and of course, we being the boys, we were all boys in that class, we said, oh, I think it's sourdough. I said, no, I want Jewish rye. We thought it was hilariously funny. I don't know if she's still alive, but I owe her an apology. <laughs> If she ever found out I was a preacher, she said, oh, miracles do happen, you know. <laughs> and what you read in the text of the that's not at all what is happening. What happens in the text is, because they're in the desert, in the cool of the night, the sap of the dew begins to form on the plants. And it forms on the plants and puts out this very rich, sticky, sweet film. And then in the morning, as the desert sun hits it, the moisture dries off and it leaves this white, powdery residue. And you can sweep it up, and as you sweep it up, it is rich in protein. And then you make bread out of it. And not only that, you can only get one day's worth, because then when you're sweeping it up, you sweep in larvae and flies and who knows what all. If you try to keep it two days, they hatch and the bread is <coughs> ruined. So you have to trust that it's going to be there day after day. After. But here's the question. Did that process start the day Moses got told Moses go out and tell him to help the man? It had been going on for centuries. It was there the very first time they entered the wilderness. They didn't see it because they weren't looking right. They didn't see this loving, living, forgiving, life-giving God behind what was there. Come, ordinary, right. Jesus tells the crowd, he tells us, I can't give you a sign because the signs are already all around you. In the bread, in the wine, in the water, in the words of the person and the face of the person sitting next to you, they are all signs and they all point to my love and my life and my forgiveness. And if you can't see that, I can't give you a sign because you And those common, ordinary things, going back to school, starting work, vacationing on Hawaii, here is this God, and all of it points to this life. I was teaching catechism, and one of the students came up, and she was taking an intro to a uh, uh, physics course and whatnot, and she says, I just have a hard time believing in God. It just doesn't make sense. She says, if God really wants to believe in me, this was her question to me, God really wants to believe in me, why doesn't he take the star? And tonight, put them in an order that says God is, and he can use any font he wants, then I'll believe in him. <laughs> and I simply said to her, when we're in Koke'e and you see the stars, how can you not believe God is? He is already there. 
this dialogue between Jesus, the crowd, the church, us. Today, Jesus gives this invitation to regard himself, Jesus, as we regard daily bread as utterly necessary for life, trusting not only that it is there, but it is there in abundance for all of us. And as we do this continuing miracle, as we eat this bread and wine, we are the ones that become consumed. We are the ones that are drawn and swallowed up in this love and life of God, a love and a life that will not run dry, a love and a life that will not disappoint, a love and a life that will not end. And we become the body of Christ and the bread for the world. Yesterday I took the golf cart back to the 18th. There were three attendants out there who apparently had been watching. <laughs> they truly wanted to maintain dignity. <laughs> and they looked at me. They looked at each other. Then looked at the ground and broke out in hilarious laughter. <laughs> And the one person who has seen me golf more than once came up to me and said, Pastor, you made the best part of my day. <laughs> Jesus was there. First one. To the last. Maybe not the way I wanted to see him. But there. Trust